I'm Paul Thompson. Um, I've been in electric fencing essentially uh, since about 1984 um, when I uh, had the good fortune to uh, get a project for uh, my final year engineering at the University of Queensland to do with electric fencing. And uh, my, my father had a property and uh, as soon as I was into that he decided I was the expert and I was therefore called upon to uh, fix his fences and his energizers and whatnot. So, steep learning curve and, and uh, many years later here I am. Um, we started in uh, 95 on the, on the back of uh, the invention of this device which was the first uh, fault to actually show you where a fault was on an electric fence and uh, that invention uh, basically catapulted what was a, uh, a background interest in electric fencing at that time uh, into my day job. We started the company and, uh, and basically built it from uh, uh, myself, a one-man show, into what it is today. Uh, we are uh, one of the forces uh, to be reckoned with in electric fencing uh, in the world. Um, JVA stands for Joint Venture Africa and uh, about 10 years ago I, I met up with a, a South African who needed uh, somebody to provide the electronics for security electric fences in South Africa. And uh, again we went on a steep learning curve because we've been in agri-electric fencing for a long time but uh, the security is a, a different kettle of fish and security in South Africa is, is a different kettle of fish again. It's, um, unless you've been there you, you can't imagine a society where um, if you have a house in Johannesburg you have an electric fence and it's not to keep animals in, it's to keep the bad guys out. And those bad guys aren't just going to steal your stereo, those bad guys are going to try and kill you. It's incredibly serious stuff. So we got serious about it and uh, designed uh, the best uh, um, range of security electric fencing. And uh, uh, the key to making all of that work was monitoring. So an electric fence to be a useful uh, tool for security has to be monitored. It has to give an alarm and let the owner know that uh, something's wrong so that they can get to their safe room or, or call the police. And the uh, monitoring links to communications, of course communicating that alarm uh, to the user. So we applied uh, skills in communications uh, with electric fencing to produce the monitors and produce the, um, the communications gear for the uh, security electric fence energizers. Once we'd satisfied the, uh, the need for the range of security uh, product, uh, my partner in said, well, now we've got a whole uh, another range of product that we need for game parks. And game parks in South Africa, of course, is big business for tourism. Uh, people want to see the big four. They want to see the, the lions and elephants and, and giraffes and, and whatnot. And these animals have to be contained and these animals have to be protected. And again, security, sorry, electric fencing steps in as the best way of doing that. And because now the animals are worth a lot of money and uh, uh, people are trying to uh, poach them, and in particular trying to uh, poach uh, the, the rhino horns, it's uh, worth a lot of money and therefore we, we again applied monitoring techniques to, uh, to long electric fences and communications uh, techniques to get the monitoring information back to uh, central stations um, so that uh, uh, park rangers, for example, could send out a, a crew to, uh, to protect their animals. So that, that's a bit of background for um, what we're doing and, uh, and why we're here. JVA as a brand uh, is, is not well known in Australia, but, but we're trying to change that. Um, after having uh, conquered the market in, in South Africa, which is one of the larger ones in the world, we've shifted our focus back uh, home to Australia. And uh, we're trying to partner up with people who uh, want our expertise in electric fencing. And we're also bringing back the technology that we've developed for security and game park fencing uh, in those markets around the world and applying it to uh, agricultural electric fencing back in this market. So what, uh, what you're seeing here today is, is uh, um, a great feat of engineering on, on Gary's behalf, the dingo fence. I had nothing to do with that. I'm an expert in electronics. I'm not an expert in fencing. I don't even call myself an expert in electric fencing. I'm an expert in the electronics that drives electric fencing. That's what I specialise in. Because of that, uh, that specialisation in that uh, tight niche, I still have an electronics manufacturing company in Brisbane that manufactures electronics in Australia. And believe it or not, we even sell to China. So, 
tightening down to that uh, very small niche has allowed us to survive where so many other uh, more general purpose electronic companies have, uh, have fallen because they've tried to um, compete directly with the Chinese. So moving on from the background to, to what you're looking at today, as I said, it's a, it's a great bit of engineering in, in the way the fence has dropped into place. And I can't claim credit for that. Um, that's all Gary's. But the power box, that's where I come in. So here today, we're, we're looking at uh, a solar powered electric fence energizer station, powering essentially two lines of fence that go around the property and come back. We, uh, we started this project remotely, that is that, you know, Gary called me and said, what do I need? And I said, you know, buy the book, this is what you need. And I thought for, for this amount of fencing, one 12 joule energizer would have been overkill. And then Gary got to the front of the property and didn't have enough voltage. And, and uh, that, that's a whole story in itself. What is enough voltage? Well, the, uh, the rule book will say that the 3,000 volts uh, will, st will stop a domestic animal, but what does it take to stop a wild animal? And that's, that basically comes down to a bit of trial and error. And uh, I, I listened and uh, uh, John and, uh, and Gary were saying they wanted at least 5,500 volts on the front fence. So we went from, from, from one uh, 12 joule energizer to two, and then we worked on the configuration of the fence wiring basically maximising the, the route for the power from here through to the farthest point in the fence. And we did that. Uh, thankfully, there was an opportunity to, to fine-tune it due to the way that it was originally wired. And now it's wired basically as a parallel system. So all three of the live wires are, are wired in parallel from the energizer out through, and they join at both ends of every strain point, which means basically we've got the largest pipe possible for electricity to travel to the extremity. That brought the, the voltage up at the end of the fence and uh, you know, it's, it's actually a much better situation than it was with the, with the single energizer with the original fence design. And that's, that basically comes down to tweaking, tweaking the, the dynamics of the system for the particular property once you get to see it and, and once you find out what you're dealing with. Part of, part of the reason that that's, uh, essentially what is not a terribly long fence is, is uh, losing uh, quite a bit of voltage is because we can't uh, rely on the ground here uh, as a conductor. We've got, we've got a good amount of uh, aluminium in the ground as, a, as an earth at this point and, and really in order to pick up uh, true ground we're probably going to have to go down a, a ridiculous amount of depth. So instead of doing that, um, Gary's actually wired the, the earth right through the system. So under every gate, an earth wire is taken through. So what we've got here is essentially an, an electrical grid of, of live and earth wires that go the whole distance right around the fence. We're not relying on the earth to carry any of the power. It's carried in the fence itself. And this, what you're seeing here is, is gonna be the, the, the worst, um, environmentally, the worst time for this fence. When, when uh, rain occurs, as it it's hopefully will soon, and, and moisture uh, profile uh, uh, exists in the soil again, more current will be able to travel through the earth and we'll get a better voltage at the extremity even than what we have now. Also, with a, a better earth, we could have run this fence with a lot less joules of electric fence energizer. One of the um, most important points I want to get across here is that this is not a standard electric fence. This is not the electric fence that uh, you know, has existed since uh, the 60s or so in Australia. This is a monitored electric fence. And, and I want to press that difference because um, the world has changed. Who has time to, to get out and, and check their electric fence all the time? And essentially, a, a electric fence is only as good as the voltage that is on it. Um, it needs that voltage there to maintain the, uh, the barrier. Albeit, uh, going back to what um, Gary said before, this is built as a much more uh, solid electric fence than most. But as those of you who, who've uh, been in electric fencing before know, when the, the voltage goes off the wire, trouble begins and, and it just builds up. So a monitored electric fence is just that. It's, it's uh, monitored for any trouble. And uh, this particular uh, setup that we're looking at uh, is monitored with uh, two units, the, the ZM1 uh, electric fence monitors that were designed for game park fencing uh, in South Africa. Right, so we developed these ZM1s to monitor very long fences uh, of game parks in South Africa. And uh, 
the, um, the first thing we had to do was solve the problem of, of uh, a transmission line. So what happens is uh, once a fence gets for long, uh, longer than a certain length, it, it becomes difficult for a, a what we call a starter fence monitor or a power monitor to see a fault uh, beyond a certain distance. Uh, we solved that problem with the ZM1 and that's a, a patented uh, bit of electronics that actually looks for the reflection in the waveform from the end of the fence. So on, on a good fence, when you're sending an electric fence uh, pulse down a long fence, it'll actually reflect at the end and come all the way back. And that's what this monitor is looking at. And uh, when there's a fault anywhere on the length of the fence, you won't get the reflection and it'll go into alarm. And uh, of course, we've checked that by putting a, a fault at the very end of the fence and, and the fence goes into alarm, uh, as expected. The grey box down in the, in the bottom right is our um, GSM uh, monitor, uh, sorry, GSM um, um, communicating device, what we call an uh, uh, SMS uplink. Solar pa um, panels uh, prices have come down, which is good for us, and uh, solar power is, is by far, um, uh, I'll say this another way, electric fencing works well on long fences when you place the energizers at the right place, and the right place for an electric fence energizer is essentially in the middle of the stretch of fencing that you want to do. So, um, assuming we'd, we'd got away with the one energizer here, and, and by the way, um, when we release a larger energizer, we'll go back to that configuration, one large energizer through two monitors. But the, um, um, when, you, when you place it at the center of the length of fence that it's going to energize, um, it's, the, it's the best possible position for the energizer, and you'll get the most power on your fence. If you're relying on mains power, for example, you, you happen to have uh, mains power at a woolshed or a pumping station or something like that, and then you've got to trunk that uh, electric fence power through a lead out uh, any more than a, 100 metres or so, um, you risk losing a lot of power before you actually hit the fence. And, and again, you, you fall victim to a, a thing called transmission line theory when you take a single uh, uh, wire which has got a characteristic impedance of about uh, uh, 300 to 500 ohms, and you hit your fence that you're trying to power, suddenly it's dividing down into multiple wires and, and, and you get a mismatch, what's known as a, a transmission line mismatch, and the power doesn't fully flow into the fence. So for those reasons, the, the best position for an energizer is, is where it needs to be according to the design of the fence, not where the mains power is. So solar is the best for this situation. Um, so, wrapping it up, we've got uh, two energizers, two monitors, we have a, a GSM unit. Um, we're fortunate enough to have a direct uh, uh, signal at, at this point, so we only needed a, a, a little aerial like this to pick up our, our GSM signal. If we'd been further away, we would have put an antenna and a Yagi, directional antenna, to pick up the, uh, the nearest um, uh, you know, Telstra uh, station. If we'd been further away than that, for example, we're doing a, a long fence, we would have had to, to actually uh, go back to somewhere where you could get reception um, using a, a, a radio repeater. And, uh, and for that, we, uh, these days, we use the Ubiquiti uh, Wi-Fi gear. So as I said before, this is a monitored electric fence and, and the means of monitoring is, is over SMS messages through the, the GSM system. Um, we can put this up to, a, um, uh, to an Amazon uh, uh, service and, and put it on, uh, on your PC using a, a web-controlled interface. But the, what we're finding is that uh, SMS uh, backbone is reliable. It's good technology, it's simple technology, and it's, and it's very easy to use. So um, this, uh, this system will um, send an SMS when there's a short on the fence. You can send it an SMS to tell it to turn on or to turn off, um, which is important if you want to do some, uh, f some fence maintenance and you, you don't like the idea of being zapped. The most important part of this to, to take away from it is that at home in the morning, um, before he does anything else, John can send a message to this saying, what's your status? So, you know, in this case, the, the pin number 1234S for status, or the whole word status if he wants to type it right out. And the fence will actually tell him how it's, how it's going. It'll say, I'm, I'm running, I've got no problems, and I'm running at a particular voltage. At the bottom of the, of the um, panel here, we've got two of our um, lightning diverters. And this is actually the only lightning diverter I know of on the market that's guaranteed to work. Guarantee, i.e., if you put one of these and lightning strikes and kills your energizer, we will repair that energizer free of charge 
uh, and we don't even care whose energizer it is. That's how confident we are in that lightning diverter. So, and that's a, a three year guarantee if you, if you buy our particular lightning diverter. The whole deal with lightning is that even though we put some lightning protection in our energizers, about 3,000 amps worth, if, you, if we let lightning into the energizer case, something is almost you know, inevitably going to go wrong. So we, we put the lightning diverters out in front. So the first thing that happens, or the first thing that a lightning pole sees when it comes down the fence is, is the, the lightning diverter. And it's simply, as per the name, diverted. The, the surge of, of current from lightning is diverted to ground. And uh, a very small amount of it then is only allowed to go through to the energizer and, and then the lightning diverter circuit in the energizer can cope with that and they survive. We've seen these uh, uh, lightning diverters completely blown apart and uh, the energizer is still working. What I think you should be thinking about is when I get a report that the electric fence has got a problem, what's the maximum length of fence I want that report to be from? And then think about that as being your, your powered length of fence. In other words, work out in modules of zones for reporting purposes, not how far can I actually push uh, a, a, you know, electric current down a wire with the biggest possible energizer on the market.